Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Charts with Dan. It was another weekend of Kung Fu Panda Dune Part 2 dominance. We're going to go over the domestic numbers and also the worldwide numbers, where Dune Part 2 is cracking a half billion dollars worldwide and is now the top of the box office around the world for 2024. I also have the return of a long-awaited chart, one from the past that we'll be seeing for the first time in quite some time. But let's look, first of all, at the numbers for this past weekend at the domestic box office, Competing at number one was Kung Fu Panda 4 with a second week drop of 48%. That's a family movie drop if I ever saw one. $30.1 million for the weekend. A total domestically now over $100 million at $107.8 million. Dune Part 2 spends its third week repeating at number two, a 38.3% drop. Another really strong hold. $28.5 million over the weekend, so competitive for that number one spot. Its domestic total is now over $200 million. Mark Wahlberg and a Dog co-starred in Arthur the King, which was a distant third place at $7.6 million, a little bit under where many people had seen that movie opening. Imaginary dropped just 44% in week number two. That's a strong hold for a horror film, even though it didn't open that big last weekend. $5.5 million in fourth place, a $19 million domestic total. Cabrini takes a 60.8% drop. That's the sort of drop you'd be expecting more from Imaginary, not the latest film from Angel Studios. It's not able to replicate the success they had with Sound of Freedom last year, $2.8 million for the weekend, and a $13 million domestic total. So let's look at some of the movies in the top five, and specifically, let's look at Dune Part 2. It has now moved up to become Timothy Chalamet's second highest grossing film ever domestically, and by next weekend, will surpass Wonka, which just set his own personal record a couple months ago, to become his highest grossing domestic film as a lead actor or an actor of any kind. And there's another thing that's really interesting, which is that for three consecutive weekends, the opening weekend, the second weekend, and now the third weekend, Dune Part 2 and Oppenheimer have had nearly identical box office runs. But that doesn't mean that Dune Part 2 is on track to make the same amount of money domestically as Oppenheimer. Let's look at their cumulative grosses first of all. You can see right there those first three days, they're pretty much just one straight line. And then we diverge. Now, I made Oppenheimer orange because the marketing for Oppenheimer was orange. And Dune Part 2 is blue because of the blue eyes of the Fremen. A lot of people said, why didn't you use orange for Dune Part 2? Because I didn't want to. But what you can see over time is the divergence of these two movies. Now they're about $25 million-ish dollars apart. So how does that work? How is it that Dune Part 2 and Oppenheimer have had nearly identical first, second, and third weekends at the box office, but are still $25 million apart? And it all comes down to the weekdays. We looked at this chart last week. This is not cumulative gross. This is day-by-day -day gross. You can see that for the first three days, Dune Part 2 and Oppenheimer were running pretty close. Oppenheimer had a slightly better Friday. Dune Part 2 had a slightly better opening Saturday. And then Oppenheimer had a slightly better opening Sunday. Then we see day four, five, six, and seven where Oppenheimer has the clear lead. And that's because it was during the summer. You had more people going during the weekday. But look at that second weekend. That would be day eight, nine, and 10. They get close again. Dune part two was just behind Oppenheimer on its second Friday. It was better than Oppenheimer on its second Saturday. And then just behind it again on its second Sunday. Then we have this past week and the pattern repeats itself. Days 11, 12, 13, and 14. That's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Oppenheimer takes the lead. And then the third weekend, we have, again, just a carbon copy. A very competitive Friday with Oppenheimer in the slight lead, a Saturday with Dune Part 2 driving more admissions, and then a Sunday with Oppenheimer driving more admissions. I've done charts for a very long time. I can't remember the last time, if there was a last time, where two movies had almost identical weekends three times in a row. It's tough to get them really even two times in a row, and it really does show you the seasonal aspect of the box office and how big of a difference that can make. Not that Dune Part 2 is running way behind Oppenheimer, but it just goes to show you the advantage of having more weekday audiences. Now, as we get into the spring break season, we're actually already in the spring break season, we'll see if maybe those weekday grosses tighten up just a little bit. Maybe some of the folks that are out of school might be going to see Dune Part 2, but it's also getting a little bit later into the release cycle. There's going to be competition going after a large part of the same market. So we'll see how it does, but these are just two movies that are very interesting to watch as they kind of weave in and out of each other's box office pads. 
Let's look at the rest of the top 10 from this past weekend. At number six was the second weekend of Love Lies Bleeding, which went from a very small release to a release in over 1,000 theaters. That's why it has a 1,548.7% business increase, but not a huge number, about $2.48, $2.5 million basically for the weekend. Its total is now at around $2.7 million. And with the sort of buzzy nature of it, you'd think that maybe it would have done a little bit more money. Bob Marley One Love brings in another $2.2 million in its fifth weekend of release. It's now about $6.5 million short of breaking that $100 million barrier. The Anthony Hopkins drama One Life cracks the top 10 in limited release under 1,000 theaters at $1.7 million. In ninth place, the American Society of Magical Negroes. God, why? Ugh, whatever. $1.3 million. And probably the last time I'll have to say that title here on the show because it was barely in the top 10 and looks to crash out of it. Not positive audience or critical responses to that film. In 10th place, rounding out the top 10 is Ordinary Angels in its fourth week of release at a sub $1 million gross for an $18 million domestic total thus far. Dropping out of the top 10, we have Migration after 12 weeks, so a solid three-month run in the top 10. Madam Webb spins her way out of the top 10 after just four weeks, and then Yolo and Met Opera La Forza del Destino, two limited release films that cracked the top 10 last week, are now out of the top 10. These are the movies that lost the most theaters this past weekend, the 15th through the 17th, and leading the pack is Madam Web, which lost 957 theaters and one month into its release is now barely still even in wide release. You can already watch it at home. It's in 1,058 theaters, so it'll be dropping out of wide release next weekend. The Chosen Season 4, Episodes 7 and 8 drops out of wide release. It lost 752 theaters. It's now in 285. Migration also drops out of wide release. It lost 628 theaters. It's now at 879 theaters. Demon Slayer to the Hashira training dropped 627 theaters. It's now playing in 257. And Wonka is now in far fewer theaters. It lost 622 to be exact. And it is now out of wide release in 382 theaters nationwide. We have a very long list of movies that closed this week. It's sort of similar to the Tony Awards and how a show will hold on to see if it wins any Tonys, and if it doesn't, then the show will close. The difference here being that there are some actual Oscar winners that just decided to wrap up their run the weekend after the Academy Awards. Killers of the Flower Moon did not win any Academy Awards, but it was open for 21 weeks and wraps up its domestic run at $68 million. The Holdovers also wrapping up its domestic run after 20 weeks, bringing in just over $20 million dollars wish after six weeks wraps up its run at 63.9 million dollars and american fiction after 13 weeks wraps up with just over 21 million dollars domestically now it's always possible that some of these movies may have just reported their grosses late but even if that's the case they are very near the end of their theatrical run and let's take a closer look at one of those films and that would be wish Wish was one of the big disappointments for disney last year and let's take a look at its estimated profit or should i say estimated loss the budget was reported at around 180 to 200 million dollars so i put it in at about 190 i gave it 150 million dollars for the prints and advertising budget that gives it a total cost of 340 million dollars to disney it brings in next to nothing from china about 184.2 million dollars internationally that translates to 73.6 million dollars going back to the investors after the theaters take their cut about 11.1 million dollars in week one about 7.1 of that goes back to the studio 22.6 million dollars in week two about 12 million dollars of that goes to the studio and then a half and half share from week three on overall the worldwide gross was right around 250 million dollars worldwide i estimate a net of around 109.3 million dollars from that gross against a 340 million dollar estimated cost that puts the estimated loss for wish at around 230.6 million dollars disney actually had a few films that came out in 2023 that lost them around 200 million dollars or more even if you hack let's say $50 million off of the actual production budget or the advertising budget, that's still a loss near $200 million. So it really was a huge disappointment to cap off a year of mostly huge disappointments for Disney. 
Four more movies also closed this past weekend. Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, after 12 weeks, ends its run at $124.4 million domestically. The Boys in the Boat, after 11 weeks, ends its run at $52.6 million. Night Swim ends a 10-week run with $32.4 million. And Drive Away Dolls only gets a three-week theatrical run and ends at just over $5 million. And let's take a close look at Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. This is another estimated profit sheet when you look at how much it brought in around $65 million from China, $244.8 million internationally. So almost $100 million of that goes back to the studio. Then we have domestic week one at $58.1 million, 34.9 going back to the studio and investors, 31.2 million coming in in week two, about 17.1 million of that goes back to the studio. And then around $35 million for the rest of its domestic run. Overall, I have the budget at $205 million. I gave it a pretty cheap print and advertising budget of just $100 million, which still brings its cost up to around $305 million. Its worldwide gross is at around $434.3 million. I estimate they net around $182.1 million against a $300 $105 million cost. That brings in an estimated theatrical loss of $122.8 million for Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, which isn't ruinous for Warner Brothers. They certainly saw worse flops last year, and it doesn't count, as I always caveat this, the ancillary revenue streams, what they made with brand tie-ins, like their big Guinness deal, and any sort of physical media sales, digital sales, streaming, all of that stuff is not included here. So $122.8 million on the sliding scale of how much money some movie Lost Studios last year isn't terrible, but of course, probably not exactly what Warner Brothers wanted either. And this is the final tally for the DCEU. First of all, domestic gross Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom ends as the ninth highest grossing DCEU film between 2019's Shazam and ahead of last year's The Flash. And looking at it worldwide, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom does a little bit better. It ends as the seventh highest grossing film in the DCEU worldwide, although more than $200 million shy of the number six film, which was 2017's Justice League. Let's take a look at what I like to call our road to recovery. The blue line are the weekend averages for the years 2015 through 2019, the five years preceding the pandemic. The red line would be the weekend averages for 2021 to 2023 when theaters are reopened. And then the dotted black line would be this year's weekend box office. And you can see that we take a dip much closer to where we were, but still above the average for what the box office has been since theaters reopened back in 2021. The highest grossing film for the 2021 to 2020 2023 window was the continued run of The Batman a couple of years ago. The highest grossing film for the 2015 through 2019 window was the debut of Beauty and the Beast, which debuted on this weekend back in 2017. Let's look outside of our shores to the top five films internationally, and Dune Part 2 stays in the top spot with another $51.2 million in international box office, followed closely by Kung Fu Panda 4 at $39.6 million. The Pig, the Snake, and the Pigeon stays in number three at $10.8 million, followed by South Korea's Exuma at $7.759 million, and the Chinese film Remember Me at $6.5 million. This is about a grandmother reconnecting with her granddaughter, it is not the Robert Pattinson romance with the surprise 9-11 twist. When you take those international numbers and you combine them with our domestic numbers, we get the top five films worldwide for this past weekend, and at number one was Dune Part 2, which adds another $79.7 million to its box office, a 37.3% drop from the weekend before. Kung Fu Panda 4 has just a 13% drop as it continues its international rollout at $69.7 million. The Pig, the Snake, and the Pigeon drops 50 52.3% at $10.8 million. Then we have Imaginary dropping 26.4% at $9.5 million. And then following behind Imaginary in the fifth spot is Exuma, which dropped just 30.9% from the previous weekend. Speaking of Dune Part 2's worldwide gross, I mentioned that it is very close to breaking that $500 million barrier. It actually has done it as we're sitting here talking right now. And it has also become Denis Villeneuve's highest grossing film of all time worldwide. It has bypassed the worldwide gross of 2021's Dune at $431.2 million, which also includes some recent re-releases. So right now his filmography at number one, Dune Part 2 at $498.1 million, followed by 2021's Dune at $431.2 million, Blade Runner 2049, which made just $257.8 million worldwide, Arrival at $202.2 million, and Prisoners at $113.3 million.
We have a lot more box office numbers to go over, but before we do, I want to thank the sponsors for this week's show. This video is brought to you by Miracle Made. I don't know if you can relate to this, but I'm what you call a hot sleeper. No matter what time of year it is, it's not unusual for me to wake up sweating if the temperature isn't just right. That's why I was so glad to start using Miracle Made sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics and makes temperature regulating bedding so that you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. I've slept on a lot of sheets and I can tell you that these are so comfortable. They're soft without trapping too much heat. They're just firm enough without feeling coarse or rough. Sleep is often at a premium for content creators, so I appreciate knowing that I'll get good sleep when I can. Go to trymiracle.com slash Dan to try Miracle Made sheets today. And whether you're buying them for yourself or as a gift for a loved one, if you order today, you can save over 40%. And if you use our promo code Dan at checkout, you'll get three free towels and save an extra 20%. Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you will get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash Dan and use the code Dan to claim your free three-piece towel set and save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash Dan to treat yourself. Thanks, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. This episode's brought to you by Stamps.com. Spring is officially here, which I think means we're also officially not in the new year anymore. But with Stamps.com, you can keep moving year-round by streamlining all your shipping to make sure that you're operating at peak efficiency. Postage rates have gone up once again, but luckily Stamps.com offers rates that you can't find anywhere else, like up to 89% off USPS and UPS. Plus, they automatically tell you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. And it's not just confirmed find the business hours, you can access the services you need from your computer anytime, day or night. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been an indispensable partner for over a million businesses who need to ship literally anything from checks to merch. And you can use Stamps.com wherever you do business. All you need is a computer and a printer. And with the Stamps.com app, it's like having a post office in your pocket 24-7. Keep your mailing and shipping moving at the speed of your business with Stamps.com. Sign up with promo code MERLE for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale, no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code MERLE. Let's look at some other charts domestically for this past weekend, and we'll start with the per theater averages for March 15th to the 17th. At number one was Exuma from South Korea, which was playing in just three theaters and brought in $20,171 per theater, just shy of having one of the best per theater debuts of the year. Ryuichi Sakamoto, Opus, was playing in just one theater, but brought in $11,293 in that theater, good enough for second place. Class to Risk, which was an influential 1960 French film, played in just one theater, but brought in $8,954 in that theater. And then we have Kung Fu Panda 4 and Dune Part 2. Look at those two averages. $7,413 for Kung Fu Panda 4. $7,410 for Dune Part 2. Even though Kung Fu Panda was in 4,067 theaters and Dune Part 2 was in 3,847 theaters, that's because Dune Part 2 is driving those premium ticket sales. So it can be in fewer theaters but have a per theater average that's almost identical to Kung Fu Panda 4. These were the top five films in limited release, so that would be 1,000 theaters or fewer. At number one was the film One Life, which was just under the threshold in 983 theaters. It made $1.7 million, followed by Shaitan in its second week in release, bringing in $389,723. Another film from India debuts on the chart, Jatnu Trudeau Takri, brought in $359,169 on an unknown number of theater screens. Then we have YOLO playing in 200 theaters bringing in just over $300,000 and also bringing in around $300,000. Snack Shack playing in 437 theaters nationwide, a very DIY publicity campaign for this film. Looking at the top 10 limited release grocers this year, so this is all films in a thousand theaters or fewer with ticket sales starting on January 1st. Doesn't matter when the movie was released. American Fiction remains at number one. It banked $8.9 million before moving into wide release. Poor Things is in second place. It banked just over $8 million 
dollars before its move into wide release. But the zone of interest is sneaking up. It's at seven point nine million dollars in third place. It will not ever make that move into wide release. So it could perhaps displace poor things when we're looking at matching limited theatrical runs. Fighter from India moves down one spot to number four. Hanuman remains at number five. Origins at number six. All of us strangers now has a final gross at number seven. The 2024 Oscar shorts are at number eight. Perfect Days is at number nine. And Guntur Karam is at number 10. This is the 2024 annual domestic box office. So this is movies released in 2024. Dune Part 2, of course, remains number one at $204.7 million. Kung Fu Panda 4 moves up three spots to number two at $107.8 million. The only other movie so far this year that's broken the $100 million barrier. Bob Marley One Love moves down one spot to number three. Mean Girls, which now has a final gross at $72.4 million, moves down to number four. The Beekeeper moves down to number five. Argyle's at number six. Madam Web is at number seven. Night Swim, now locked into a gross at $32.4 million, is at number eight. Imaginary jumps onto the chart at number nine with $19 million. And Ordinary Angels remains at number 10 at $18 million. Demon Slayer to the Hashira Training falls off the top 10 list. Looking at all tickets sold since January 1st, so this includes movies that were also released in 2023, Dune Part 2 is at number 1 at $204.7 million, Kung Fu Panda 4 is at number 2, Bob Marley One Love is at number 3, Wonka moves down to number 4, followed by Migration at number 5, Mean Girls moving down two spots to number 6, The Beekeeper moves down to number 7, Anyone But You moves down to number 8, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom is locked in there at number 9, having sold just over $48 million worth of tickets Tickets in the calendar year 2024, and Argyle remains at number 10. I mentioned Dune Part 2 is the highest grossing film of the year. This is the 2024 worldwide box office chart, and you can see that it has now topped all of those early year releases from China to become number one around the world, $498.1 million. As of taping this show, it'll be over $500 million today. YOLO moves down to number two. Pegasus 2 moves down to number three. Article 20 and Boonie Bear's Time Twist remain at numbers four and five. Kung Fu Panda debuts on the chart with 177 $7.1 million worldwide, and it'll be looking to break into the top five very soon. Bob Marley, One Love moves down one spot to number seven. The Beekeeper moves down to number eight. Mean Girls moves down to number nine. Madam Web moves down to number 10. And Argyle drops off the 2024 box office worldwide altogether. Now, there's one chart that I used to do and haven't done in a while, which is what I call the 365-day chart. So basically, you take today's date, you roll it back a year. What are the top 10 grossing films over that calendar year? March 19th to March 19th, as we're doing the show today. Barbie is, of course, at number one. And these are mostly 2023 releases because we haven't had a lot of huge breakout releases worldwide yet. So Barbie's at number one. The Super Mario Brothers movie's at number two. Oppenheimer is there at 900. $60.2 million at number three. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 is at number four. Fast X is at number five. Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse is at number six. Wonka is at number seven. The Little Mermaid is at number eight. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 is at number nine. And Dune Part 2 is now on the chart as far as highest grossing films over the last 365 days. So it's going to look to be climbing that chart. And we have other movies coming out in the next several months that are also going to look to break onto this chart. And the reason why Dune Part 2 is on there is because particularly a couple of the early year Chinese releases from last year have rotated off the chart because it's been more than a year since they came out. We're approaching that point for the Super Mario Brothers movie in early April. That would rotate off of this chart, having been on the chart for 365 days, so it would enter that 365-day Hall of Fame. I like this chart. Sometimes I don't do it because it's not very interesting because it's really just the top 10 movies of the last year, but we're getting to a point in the year where some 2024 releases are going to start breaking in and some 20. 23 releases are going to start rotating it out. So let's take a look at this and see how long it stays interesting. Before we go, as always, I like to take a look at a weekend in box office history. This is actually the fourth anniversary of the last weekend that theaters were open before they closed for the COVID-19 pandemic back in 2020. It's hard to believe it's been four years, but we're not going to go back to 2020. We're going to go back a little further to March 13th through the 15th, 1998, the great Leo DiCaprio versus Leo DiCaprio battle of spring 1998. I will set the scene for you, which is that Titanic came out right around Christmas and was a box office 
juggernaut. It was dominant. It stayed number one all the way until the next movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio came out. And the big buzz, actually Titanic in its box office run, was sort of the origin story for me to follow the box office week to week. The big buzz was, will Leo topple Leo? Could the only movie possible of toppling Titanic out of the number one spot right now be another movie with Leonardo DiCaprio? That was a movie called The Man in the Iron Mask, and it came close, but was not able to do it. As you can see, Titanic spent a 13th week there on the chart at number one. It basically had the exact same gross that weekend as the previous weekend. It dropped 0.2% for a domestic total to that point of $471.4 million on its way to a domestic total of $600 million. That's just for the initial release. And The Man in the Iron Mask fell about $300,000 short of taking that number one spot. It came in at $17.2 million. It finaled out at around $56.6 million. In third place was the second week of U.S. Marshals, the sequel to The Fugitive. It dropped 32.7% for an 11 point $3 million weekend too. It finaled out around $57.1 million, so nowhere close to the original Fugitive film. Goodwill Hunting, which was marching through the Oscars and everything else in its 15th week of release, was at number four. It dropped just 6.4% from the previous weekend. Its domestic total at that time was already over $100 million. It would final out at about $138.4 million. And then Adam Sandler and Drew Barrymore's The Wedding Singer spent a fifth week in the top five. It dropped 24.7% from the weekend before for a running total of $63.4 million. Its final domestic total was right around $80.2 million. Of course, because we're talking about movies from a long time ago, we don't like to just leave those grosses there. We like to adjust for inflation and see what those grosses would look like in today's dollars. And when we hit that inflation button, we see that Titanic had an adjusted week 13 gross of $33.4 million. That's an adjusted running total to that point of nearly $900 million domestically, domestically for a final adjusted domestic total of $1.1 billion. That's how much money Titanic would have made in today's dollars just here in the United States and Canada. The Man in the Iron Mask grossed an adjusted $32.8 million on its way to a final adjusted gross at $108.4 million. U.S. Marshals was at $21.6 million adjusted, also at $108 million for its final domestic gross adjusted. Goodwill Hunting grossed an estimated $9.2 million adjusted for inflation. Its adjusted total domestically was $263.5 million when all was said and done. And The Wedding Singer was at $8.8 million adjusted. Its final adjusted to total just over $150 million. And that wraps up Charts with Dan for this week. We've got a big week of stuff here on the channel. First of all, at the embargo time, I will have my review of Ghostbusters, Frozen Empire. Get ready for more hotel room ASMR because I'm going to have to travel to see that one. But I will have that review this week. Also opening this weekend theatrically, we have Immaculate starring Sydney Sweeney. I'll also have reviews here on the channel for Roadhouse, which is premiering on Amazon Prime Video this week, as well as the first handful of episodes of X-Men 97 which is premiering on Disney Plus. So it's a review heavy week here on the channel. Be sure to stay tuned right here because I'm going to have my thoughts on all of that stuff. Thank you so much for spending part of your day here with me. I hope to see you again. If you like what you see, be sure to share, like, subscribe, hit the bell, all that stuff. I know people get tired of hearing it, but that's how the channel grows. I appreciate all of your time. Until next time, stay safe and I'll see you then. Bye.